Welcome, I'm Dr. Daniel Shereen, Medical Director for the Northwest Ohio EMS Consortium. Today, we will discuss in the selective spinal mobilization process with spinal motion restriction procedure. This presentation was combined with some video from Dr. Frank Castro Marin, along with the Chandler, Mesa, and Scottsdale Fire Departments. We will talk about the historical perspective and incidence of spinal mobilization, discuss why we mobilize, review the pathophysiology of the injured spine, review the Northwest Ohio EMS Selective Spinal Mobilization Guideline, demonstrate how to perform the screening exam, and discuss the spinal motion restriction procedure. This picture pretty much starts the historical perspective of how EMS providers prior to 2013 have assessed and transported their patients. From a historical perspective, for the past 30 years, EMS providers were taught to have a very low threshold to apply spinal mobilization. Most EMS textbooks emphasize, quote, mechanism of injury, end quote, as the primary reason for mobilization and even transport to a trauma center. Mechanisms of injury essentially started to trump the patient interview and physical exam. Other factors from a historical perspective included fear of punishment from the physician, or in some instances, it was the easiest thing to do. While the exact origins of VAC boards and EMS are unclear, Dr. Farrington in 1968 recommended the use. He has quoted, historically, it is estimated that the 25% of spinal cord injury may be aggravated at the initial insult, either during transport or early in the course of treatment. It's also stated that it should be mentioned that this data are more than 20 years old and no data are available from actual studies. But careful movement and the use of the appropriate extrication techniques are crucial in all trauma patients with spinal cord injury, quote, end quote. Here, they were referring to the patients with clear signs of spinal cord injury. But they also go and say, quote, or in mechanism of injury with the potential to cause spinal injury, end quote. Now, they lump in everybody, including those with normal exams. This is the part where the science has evolved. Bernhardt and all conclude by saying, quote, Immobilization of the entire spine is a management priority and it should be undertaken in a systematic function or fashion. End quote. We generally, the generally accepted theory behind the problem of neurologic deterioration and after initial injury is that we have the potential to move the, the injured spine and cause further injury. The theory is that movement at the injury site causes unstainable segments or sharp bony fragments to damage or cut the spinal cord. So pre-hospital fighters use patient packaging to limit further movement during extrication and transport to the hospital. We use visible movement of the spine as a surrogate measure for movement at the injury site. We conclude that less visible movement is better patient care. So has anyone, has anyone successfully tested this theory? The current practice, the result is that greater than 50% of trauma patients get fully mobilized, with 13% not even being asked about pain. So the question becomes, is there anything wrong with this? Thankfully, spinal trauma is a low frequency disease less than 1 million patients per year with suspected C-spine injuries. Of that, only 2% actually have fracture. The problem is that we get fewer chances to get it right when it does occur and the results of these injuries can be devastating to the patients as 1% develop neural deficits. The majority of trauma patients will experience either no injury or minor injury. As shown by these numbers, a small subset will experience catastrophic, irreversible injuries. EMS spinal mobilization processes cannot make normal spines more safe and cannot undo permanent spinal injury. But the argument can be made that all packaged patients have the, the potential be, to be harmed. In 2001, 
Kwan and colleagues performed a meta-analysis that looked at the effects of pre-hospital spinal mobilization on mortality, neurologic disability, spinal stability, and negative effects on trauma patients. They found no high-quality randomized control trials addressing these questions. But just because the evidence proving the benefit of spinal mobilization has not been directly observed, it doesn't automatically make it true that spinal mobilization is universally bad. It's important not to fall for this logical fallacy, known as an argument for ignorance. Because it's also stated by Smith and all who performed a systematic review of quote parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge systematic reviews of randomized control trials end quote and were unable to identify any randomized controlled trials of parachute intervention at preventing death or major trauma related to quote gravitational challenges end quote just like parachutes not being proven to help with gravitational challenges, all we can say is that spinal mobilization is possibly not helping, or it is helping some, but we haven't been clever enough to design experiments capable of proving any benefit. Hustle and all, in the retrospective chart review comparing patient outcomes between the University of New Mexico and the University of Malaya in Malaysia. All patients with acute blunt traumatic spine injuries were transported directly from the injury site to the hospital. None of the 120 patients seen at the University of Malaya had spinal mobilization during transport, but all of the 334 patients seen at the University of Mexico did. The hospitals were comparable in physician training and clinical resources. Neuro injuries were deemed either disabling or non-disabling. Patients in Malaysia were twice as likely to have less disability than the University of New Mexico patients. Stated another way, this meant that there were less than 2% chance that immobilization has any beneficial effect. Criticism of the study, though, not powered enough to catch differences in the group size due to small sample size. There's less motor vehicle collisions in Malaysia, groups not matching the severity for their non-spinal injuries, and the data did not include the types of spinal fractures found. So what does this really matter? The truth is that further movement of the injured spine or spinal cord is just one threat to the trauma patient. What about the other threats like the ones listed here? The list is made up of all the threats to your patients that have actually been proven to occur when a patient is subjected to spinal mobilization. Remember that only 2% of these patients will have spine fractures and only 1% develop neural deficits. So is it okay to subject the other 98% of patients to all these other potential complications? In looking at the anatomy, the spinal column consists of a complex structure of interlocking reinforcing vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs all held together by ligaments and muscles that are also self-reinforcing. Specifically, there are 24 vertebrae that are connected together by an anterior and posterior ligamentous structure. Between each of the vertebrae are vertebral discs that help with some stabilization and cushioning of the vertebral bodies. The spinal column and spinal cord takes a significant force to produce component failure in the adult spine. Specifically, it takes about 2,000 to 6,000 newton of force to fracture a cervical spine. By comparison, hanging a 4 kilogram head off the end of a treatment table generates about 40 newtons. Experts agree that it is safe to assume that subsequent force and energy deposition produced by EMS movement is is severely orders of magnitude less than the force required to cause new damage or worsen pre-existing damage. As such, they argue that core damage occurs only at the time of initial impact. Energy deposition during emergency treatment and extrication that we try to prevent using spinal immobilization are not sufficient to cause more injuries. 
But normal range of motion is defined as, quote, the amount of non-destructive distortion tolerated by spine and soft tissues, end quote. It requires almost no energy to move the spine within the normal range of motion. Since resistance to movement is essentially zero in uninjured segments of the spine, resistance cannot significantly be less than zero in injured areas of the spine. You can't have, quote, less than zero, quote, resistance. In fact, resistance to movement is generally greater in the injured segments of the spine. Why is resistance generally greater in the injured areas? It's greater due to preloading of tissues by edema, spasm, and mechanical impingement from the bony structures. This is why cadaver model studies are questionable. In these studies, iatrogenic injuries to the spine are created after rigor mortis has taken effect. This creates a condition where the uninjured segments are more stiff and the injured segments are less stiff than they are in the real clinical conditions. This experimental model gets, its backward, gets it backward compared to real life. The bottom line is that is only when the normal range of motion is exceeded that excess energy can cause tissue destruction at damaged spinal segments and forces applied to the injury site. So we're most likely the reason behind the 25% of our patients getting worse while under our care. Well, it's really the same reason traumatic brain injury patients get worse. Just like in traumatic brain injury, our top priority is to reduce tissue hypoxia and hypoperfusion for the entire patient. Certainly, the entire central nervous system, of which the spinal cord is only one part. This requires sophisticated, comprehensive care of the patient including possible advanced airway management, blood transfusion, and surgical intervention. Most of this comprehensive care can only happen in the hospital. So what saves lives in major trauma is rapid, safe transport attempting to maintain blood pressure and prevent hypoxia. The way that we curtail tissue hypoxia the most will be to transport rapidly and safely to definitive care. Stated in other ways, we should work most at minimizing delays in transport. We know that spinal mobilization is one of these potential delaying factors. We already get that spinal mobilization will not improve irreversible damage, and it cannot make intact spines be more safe. But even the patient with unstable spinal injury, especially the unstable injury, can be potentially harmed by delays in reaching definitive care. Also, patients with unstable injuries are often going to have other critical, time-sensitive injuries. So we have to honestly consider the potential harm caused by spinal mobilization as we consider the potential benefit. To summarize, spinal mobilization is incredibly overutilized. Most injured patients are mechanically stable enough that only significant additional force will create more damage. Those few patients whose injuries are so unstable to the point that there is literally zero resistance to further movement compared with uninjured segments probably suffered irrevocable damage during the initial impact. The bottom line is that everyone subject to collar and backboard has the potential to be harmed. Not convinced yet? You may tell yourself, but I just don't want to screw up, even once, and be blamed for one bad outcome. Or you could say, spinal mobilization has to be in the best interest of the patients regardless. Or, it's the safe and conservative thing to do. Well, the simple truth is that it's not. We do not know that any spinal immobilization techniques actually help. We have proven that it hurts in several ways. You cannot mindlessly apply an intervention that is known to do harm when the chance of benefit is theoretical at best. This is not how medicine works. So how does spinal immobilization hurt? Well, first off, when applied to the patient, a cervical collar can cause vascular obstruction of blood draining from the brain. 
This effect was prospectively observed in a study published in 1996. The authors tested standard stiff neck rigid collars on injured patients requiring ICP monitoring. They observed a mean rise in ICP of 4.5 millimeters of mercury. At the same time, the mean arterial pressure was not had not changed significantly. So the, the new rise was from the distortion of the venous drainage specifically. Also, cervical collars also obscure neck injuries. They produce axial distracting forces which might cause additional injury and they make airway management more difficult. In regards to the rigid backboards, they are known to cause elevations in tissue interface pressure enough to cause pressure necrosis, aka the, the decubitus ulcers. This is especially true in the insentuate patient. It has been proven that backboards can cause neck and back pain in previously asymptomatic patients. Clinically, this often results in the ordering of a costly diagnostic test that initially may not have been necessary. Studies have shown that spinal mobilization in a supine position results in a reduction of respiratory capacity by as much as 15 to 20 percent. And furthermore, respiratory effectiveness is markedly reduced by commonly used restraint systems. Finally, we all know that spinal mobilization takes time and multiple personnel with delays in transport are known to worsen outcomes for the critically trauma patient. How do victims of penetrating trauma fare? Well, Elliot Hall and colleagues looked at over 45,000 patients using the National Trauma Data Bank. They found mortality to be as twice as high in the mobilized group compared to those not mobilized. Only 30 patients, or 0.01%, had an incomplete cord injury and needed operative spine fixation. The number needed to treat with spinal mobilization to potentially benefit one patient was 1,032. The number needed to harm with spinal mobilization to potentially contribute to one death was 66. What about time spent by the patient in spinal mobilization? Patients are not supposed to remain on backboards. However, we know both through personal experience and medical studies the patients might remain immobilized for substantial amounts of time after they arrive at the emergency department. At the very least, they have to be seen by a provider and examined before removal. But some locations might have protocols stating that removal can only take place after radiographic imaging. That can mean hours on a backboard. In the Journal of Trauma in 2002 with Domir et al., they looked at the validation of pre-hospital clinical spinal clearance criteria. With this study, they looked at specifically 295 patients out of 8,975 cases with spinal injury. Of the 295 patients, with pre the pre-hospital providers were able to identify 280 of the patients, or 94.9% with spinal injuries. Of the remaining 15 patients, 13 of them had stable injuries, and it stated that the remaining two unstable injuries would have been caught with a more accurate evaluation by pre-hospital providers. So now what? The National Association of EMS Physicians with the American College of Surgeons produced the white paper for EMS spinal precautions. The paper looked at the fact that the use of backboarding was based more on historical and mechanistic versus symptomatic evaluations. The backboard use has potential sequela or complications. The paper endorses clinical evaluation with selective immobilization based upon the Nexus criteria. Also, the 2014 International Trauma Life Support the long board used for spinal motion restriction of the trauma patients. This group produced their white paper to update ITLS instructors and providers of spinal motion restriction and use of long boards and other rigid devices, where they 
similar to the other white paper, indicated that backboard use was more to be in a selective process. So our, our EMS providers should be st probably still be applying full collar and backboard to these patients unless they have a reasonable and well-documented concern that full borne collar would make the patient's situation or condition worse, specifically looking at patients with blunt trauma with loss of consciousness or spine tenderness and neural complaints. Also, any anatomic deformity of the spine. Lastly, the high energy mechanisms with acute loss of consciousness, distracting injuries, or inability to communicate. This is kind of similar to what the nexus that we'll be talking about in a bit. So with spinal mobilization, ultimately, it's we're allowing EMS to selectively immobilize the patients. We're also allowing EMS to use the least amount of package needed for safe transport. And we're going to be monitoring the outcomes. There's no real such thing as, quote, spinal mobilization, end quote. Cervical collars and hard, smooth spine boards might minimize visible movement, but they do so by transferring force often distracting force to other areas of the spine. Patients are prone to slip motion on smooth spine boards. This can cause worse spine motion when the head and neck are fixed in place. Standard extrication techniques used by EMS personnel can cause up to four times more cervical spine movement than controlled self-extrication of the patient. The ritualized standing takedown is probably the worst example of nonsensical practice. First of all, if the patient is ambulatory, it automatically makes it very unlikely that he or she has suffered an unstable injury. Secondly, strapping a patient to a backboard when lying, in a f when lying at flat causes significant distracting forces along the entire spine. With this understanding, we introduce the concept of spinal motion restriction to remind us that everything we do while we handle the patient causes spinal movement. But movement with minimal force and minimized dissipated energy is highly unlikely to cause further harm. So we're empowering the EMS. Several studies show EMS capable of deciding when and more importantly, what to mobilize a patient with. The Nexus and the Canadian C-Spine Rule are the National X-ray Utilization Study, <clears throat> which are two of the most respected and largest studies on clearing C-spines and considered the gold standard used by doctors. Our new guideline, like many other similar guidelines and protocols used around the U.S., are derived from these two studies. There's also additional study that we'll talk about that shows the rotational forces applied during spinal mobilization. With Nexus, it was, used, it was developed to help physicians with ordering unnecessary x-rays and thus reducing the amount of radiation exposure that patients are receiving. The Nexus clinical criteria to avoid x-rays include midline cervical pain or tenderness on exam, altered mental status, <coughs> evidence of intoxication, neurologic abnormalities, or the prevalence of a painful distracting injuries. In a few slides, we'll talk about the guidelines, and I've always made mention in the past of a mnemonic called NSAID, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. This is what aspirin, ibuprofen are a part of. The NSAID, N-S-A-I-D, is also the, the mnemonic to help you guys remember the proper steps necessary when performing the selective spinal mobilization. When, when performed correctly, only 30% of injuries were identified if only one of the previous five criterion were used. If all five were used, there was a 99.8% of injuries were identified. 
So selective spinal mobilization algorithm is a screening tool derived from widely accepted medical research, current practice, and expert consensus. It's designed to identify a subset of patients that may be safely transported to the emergency department for definitive evaluation without application of certain spinal mobilization equipment. This algorithm does not constitute, quote, clearing, end quote, of the spine. Specifically, patients with mechanism of injury with potential for causing spine injury shall have a spine injury clinical assessment performed. The purpose of the spinal mobilization and the spinal motion restriction should reduce patient discomfort and protects the patient from additional harm. Spinal mobilization that increases pain should be avoided at all costs. This is a multi-step process to assess if the patient requires immobilization. If the patient requires immobilization, then we will practice spinal motion restriction procedures. The Northwest Ohio EMS Guidelines. Selected spinal mobilization for the BLS will be Tab 8, Guideline 26. For the ALS, it will be Tab 8, Guideline 48. Specifically, the first step is to determine the mechanism of injury. High speed, diving injuries, blunt trauma to the head and neck region, as outlined in the guidelines along with several others, will help in determining what form or what measures need to be taken. The next question is then to ask, is the patient ambulatory at the scene? If the patient is ambulatory at the scene, longboard immobilization is not required, aka the standing takedown does not have to be performed. All patients then go forth and start the next process or the next steps of the selective spinal mobilization. While performing this, we need to maintain inline spinal mobilization. You have to ask the patient how old they are. If they're over 65 or under 2, the nexus criteria and the Canadian C-spine rule are not valid and therefore these patients should have extra caution and selective immobilization should be performed. From there, unreliable unable to reliably communicate with EMS providers to perform the exam. Specifically, any language barrier. Are they able to lack cooperation during the exam? Is there any evidence of drug or alcohol intoxication? Or do they have the painful destructive injuries such as long bone fracture? The next piece, again, going back to the mnemonic NSAID, is the neurologic exam. Basically, you're looking at any focal weakness, numbness, or paresthesias. With this, we'll talk about the wrist and hand extensions using the foot plantar flexion and foot dorsiflexion, getting a gross sensation of all exams, and then asking or checking for any paresthesias. And we'll talk more about this in the next several slides. The next part is by performing a spinal exam, specifically assessing from head all the way down to the butt for any point tenderness the spinal process, midline pain or axial load or midline pain with range of motion. Any of these constitute potential injury and again selective immobilization needs to be performed. Alter mental status or any alteration in patient. Is the patient intoxicated in any way? This can be either through drugs or alcohol. The final piece is any distracting injuries. Any painful injury that might distract the patient from the pain of the C-spine injury or thoracic or lumbar injuries. Traditionally, this was thought to be a long bone fracture but of recently, they've also included things in there like abdominal uh, injuries 
um, that would again uh, distract a patient from the spinal injury that has occurred. One of my partners, when I was learning, the first thing that he taught me was to come up and pinch the side of the patient's neck. If the patient would feel the pain and scream, then in his mind, he felt that the patient did not have any distracting injuries. If you were to go and pinch the patient's neck and the patient did not realize this, then in his mind, the patient has some formal spinal or, or potential spinal injury and the patient could not be cleared clinically. The last thing is really if the patient fails any of the previous mentioned uh, items, selective spinal mobilization is required using the spinal motion restriction process. If they are not, if they answered no to all of that, then spinal mobilization is not required. So next, we will talk about the actual exam. Checking motor sensory function in all four extremities, making sure that there are no deficits or abnormalities anywhere. All right, show me both hands out like this for me. Keep them nice and firm, don't let me move your muscles. So we're gonna press on the fingers here, he's got good strength there. We're gonna to try to move the hands back and forth and he's nice and locked in there showing good strength. This extension maneuver represents the lowest cervical and then highest thoracic nerve level. If I just ask him to squeeze my fingers, that's actually a little bit higher in the cervical spine. It doesn't give me information of the lowest cervical level uh, uh, and that, that uh, powers the upper extremity. So we want to see extension. Good. Thank you very much. All right. Now we're going to check down the lower extremities. Point your toes door, uh, towards your nose for me. Nice and firm. Good. And now push down for me. Good. All right. Are you having any numbness and tingling anywhere along the legs here? No. All right, show me your hands one more time. Any numbness and tingling here on the hands at all? No. No, good. And so after you've checked your motor strength in the upper and lower extremities, then the key thing is checking with the patient that they have no areas of numbness and also no paresthesia. So specifically tingling, if they're reporting that, that is a bad sign and makes you concerned about some sort of spinal cord injury. Remember, the neurologic exam is broken down into five parts. So I have the patient extend their arms bilaterally like telling someone to stop. They should then have their wrists extended backwards with their fingers spread wide. To tell them to keep their arms extended and fingers spread, attempt to push their arms in along with pressing the, pressing the fingers to the side. The next part is to have them push down on the feet on your hands like on the gas pedal and brake. Finally, they should have them pull their toes to the nose as you attempt to pull down. The last part is testing, testing the sensation in the upper and lower extremities. No, you do not have to test every dermatome as pictured here, but a gross examination should be performed. And then the last piece again, just as mentioned in the video, is to ask if they are having any tingling sensation. So how do we document this? Well, start off initially with GCS of 15 alert and oriented. Wrist, hand extension strength normal bilaterally. Foot plantar flexion and dorsal flexion strength normal bilaterally. And then sensory intact times four, no paresthesia is reported. Any abnormal exam with GCS, drowsy, confused, wrist hand extension strength weakness, foot dorsiflexion strength normal, foot plantar flexion weak bilaterally. Patients report severe paresthesias by lateral arms and hands, or the sensory is absent below level umbilicus, or any other example is a potential abnormal exam. All of these would fail the selective spinal mobilization and therefore require the spinal motion restriction. So far, what we've really talked about is people over 65 are more likely to have fractures even with normal exams. Think at least cervical collar placement. Crews need to be more strict about packaging patients with abnormal GCS, mental status, intoxicated on either drugs or alcohol. But again, we will talk about the intoxicated patients some more. 
Spinal muscle restriction, it's really better describes the procedure used to care for patients with possible unstable spinal injuries. In the Emergency Medicine Journal, Dixon et al. in their biomechanical analysis of spinal mobilization during pre-hospital extrication was proof was a proof concept study showing that controlled self-extrication by a simulated patient resulted in less spine movement compared with standard extrication techniques. What they did here was allow patients to get out of a car by themselves, to place a cervical collar around the patient and then let them get out themselves, used a long board for extrication, and then ultimately talked about using a Kendrick extrication device to remove the patient. This study, this study was only exp under experimental conditions. Results in the real world may not be consistent, but it at least gives an idea that placing a patient in a cervical collar and letting them extricate themselves in a controlled fashion had the least amount of motion of the cervical spine. Using the least amount of equipment necessary to achieve stabilization is the second part of the spinal motion restriction. Most of the times applying cervical collar and letting the patient self-extricate is enough. The spinal motion restriction includes reduction of gross movement by the patient, prevention of duplicating the damaging mechanism to the spine, and then finally regulatory reassessment of motor and sensory functions that we will see in the videos in the scenarios. So what equipment? Well, it's pretty much what they say is, quote, backboards are like spatulas. At some point, that burger has to be put on the bun. So if you really think about it, the backboard is just a means to an end. Just like a spatula about putting a burger on a hamburger, we use the backboard to move the patient to the litter and then remove the backboard from the patient. Self-extrication with collar may be better, but only for normal, reliable patients. This is also the opportunity where scoop stretchers may come into play using the Kendrick devices or short boards. And then so many departments now are going with vacuum mattresses. The good thing about the vacuum mattresses is that it conforms to the patient and reduces the potential pressure sores, which also allows for the patient to be fully immobilized and secured in a very comfortable fashion. In regards to the car seats, the NHSTA says it's okay to use if the car is drivable, the nearest car door was undamaged, no injuries to any occupant, no airbag deployed, and there is no visible damage to the car seat itself. More importantly though, the pediatric patients found in the car seats and involved in motor vehicle collisions, we need to use the following if selective spinal mobilization is indicated. Infants restrained in a rear-facing seat may be immobilized and extricated in the car seat if the mobilization is secure and his or her condition allows, i.e. there's no respiratory distress or shock. Children restrained in a car seat with a high back may be immobilized and extricated in the car seat. However, once removed from the vehicle, check for selective spinal mobilization and perform spinal motion restriction application as necessary. Children restrained in a booster seat without a backboard need to be extricated and immobilized following standard spinal motion restriction procedures as described. Once we get to the patient to the emergency department, it's helpful to discuss with the emergency department why you decided to package or not package a patient. Share your information in the decision making process. Have a conversation with the nursing and physician staff. Patient packaging no longer is a contextual clue to guide radiograph needs. ED providers will have to independently re-examine and decide if radiograph is indicated. 
As previously stated in regards to the combative patient, avoid methods of interactions that provoke increased spinal motion or agitations. If you have to coax these patients to lay flat on the stretcher, then do so. Fighting with a patient to put a cervical collar on might be more detrimental to the patient. Make sure that you document appropriately. For those that are participating in interfacility transports, it may be healthy to take a, quote, trust no one approach when receiving a patient for transfer to another facility. But taking backboard steps to reapply a rigid backboard cannot be justified with evidence reviewed here. EMS collars are not always intended for use beyond the pre-hospital and ED setting. The best method might be to stock and apply rehabilitation collars such as a Philadelphia collar if the crew feely, really feels that this is absolutely necessary. And using a sheet transfer from a hospital gurney to mobile gurney for ambulance or aircraft transport. We need to find other tools aside from rigid backboards to quote, put handles on the patient, end quote, especially with the intubated or paralyzed patients. Lastly, we need to be a good neighbor. We need to reach out to our city pools, our school programs, and start building a rapport and educational process with them. We need to work with the lifeguards and the athletic trainers. We need to make sure that there's a vision and concept, expectations are all aligned. If patients are already packaged, don't change course unless something goes wrong. Over the next few slides, we will assess some scenarios. These videos can also be found on the Northwest Ohio EMS Consortium's website. How you doing today? Uh, not too good. No? Looks like you fell off the, tree, off the ladder here. Yeah. Tell me what happened. Oh, well, I was trimming the tree here and uh, I leaned over too far and the ladder just went out from under me. Okay. So how high up on that ladder were you? Oh, about halfway. About halfway up the ladder. Are you hurting anywhere right now? Mm. Besides this, uh, this uh, laceration it seems no. you have on your forehead, is that the only thing that's hurting you? Yeah, I think this, just that, I feel pretty good other okay. than that. Okay. Did you pass out? Do you remember? No. You didn't get dizzy when you were standing up there prior to the fall? You just kind of no. lost your balance and fell? Yeah. Okay, good. Do you have any medical history we should be concerned about, like a cardiac history? No. All right. Well, we're going to assess you. This gentleman behind you is going to hang on to your head, and we're just going to check you out and make sure you're okay. Do you know where you're at right now? Yeah. Where are you at? Uh, I'm at this business where I'm uh, cutting the tree. I don't know the address. Okay. Do you know what day of the week this is? Um, yeah, it's uh, Friday. And what month? Uh, November. Okay. Are you on any kind of medication, like blood thinning medications that we need to be concerned about? No. No. Okay. Okay. You say you only have pain in your forehead, is that correct? Yes. You don't have any other pain in the rest of your body? I don't think so. Ed, I want you to go ahead and do a full head to toe on him. I'm going to continue asking him some questions, all right? How you doing, Charlie? Okay. Took a nice fall there, didn't you? Yeah. My name's Ed. I'm going to check you out. If anything hurts, you let me know, okay? Okay. Anything hurt up in here? No. All right. How about back here? No. Anything over in here? No. All right. What about back here on your neck? Anything hurt? No. Down here on your back? No. Anything hurt back here? No. All right. How about there? No. Nothing. What I'm going to need you to do, Charlie, I want you to hold your hands up like this and pull them kind of close to your body. I'm going to touch your fingers. Try not to let them move, okay? Anything feel weird in here? Any numbness, tingling, anything like that? No. Okay. Now what I want you to do is I want you to point both your toes straight up to the air. All right. And I want you to pull your toes back to your face, okay? Anything feel weird there? No. All right, push down like gas pedals. Anything feel weird there? No. All right, how about in here? Any numbness, tingling? No. Okay. Okay, Ben, minus the lack on his head, uh, motor sensory is good, clear head to toe. I uh, checked his back. He's got no uh, pain in his back, neck, on palp. Okay, Charlie, I'm going to go ahead and bandage your head right now. Okay. Okay. 
Now, which hospital did you say you wanted to go to? Um, Banner Baywood, if that's all right. Banner Baywood sounds good to me. Hey, Case, you want to hand me that C-collar while we had them get them strapped up here? You good with that, boss? You know what? I think we're good without that, Ed. He, uh, you said you checked his C-spine. He's got no, uh, no cervical tenderness, no deficits whatsoever. Is that correct? That's correct. And Charlie, just remind me again, you've had nothing to drink? And no. you're on no medication, no debilitating medication? No. So, Ed, I think we're good. He's, uh, he's reliable. He's got uh, no neural deficits. He's not complaining of any sort of uh, no. neck or back pain. So let's go ahead and just see if we can do it without. It'd okay. be a lot more comfortable for Charlie. You good with that, Charlie? Yeah. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to help, help you to stand up and make sure that you're good like that. You're not, still not feeling any sort of dizziness? No. Okay. So other than taking a tumble off this ladder, you're doing pretty good today, huh? Yeah. All right, good. Thanks, all right, Charlie. you sit still for a second. We're going to tell you what to do, Charlie, all right? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and bring your knees up, okay? We're going to get under your arms, and we're going to bring you up on, on a three count. Are you ready? Yeah. On three. One, two, three. Watch that. All right, tell me how you're feeling. Feeling you're good. Good? You're not dizzy? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. We're going to move you to the back, to the uh, gurney. All right. Okay. Just going to bring that in, guys. I want you to turn towards this gentleman here. There you go. We're going to have you sit up in the crease. There you go. We're going to have you lean back into there, and I'm going to go ahead and bring your knees up. Anything, all right. Anything feel different, Charlie? No, I feel all right. You feel okay, Charlie? Yeah. All right, what I want to do is I want to reassess your, make sure you're okay, all right? I want you to bring your hands up okay. like Ed held you do before, okay? Put your fingers up like that. Hold them stiff for me, all right, while I squeeze them together. Okay. Feel any pain when I do that? No. Any numbness or tingling in your hands? No. Okay, we're good with that. Go ahead and relax your hands. I'm going to do the same assessment with your feet. I want you to pull your toes up towards your nose like you had you do. Good. Do you feel any pain when you do that? No. You feel me squeezing your feet? Yeah. Okay, good. I want you to push down on my hands like gas pedals. All right, good. No pain when you do that? No. All right, good. And we're still good here. No pain. You feel me touching you, all right? Yeah. No pain? Oh, no. All right. All right, so you're comfortable We how we've got you here? All right, we're going to go and seatbelt you in now, and we're going to take you over to Banner Baywood. As seen in this video, it's quite obvious that the EMS providers went through the selective spinal mobilization process. Again, make sure that you review the steps for the examination and practice with your individual departments. Also, take note that on each side, they would go and repeat the exam anytime they moved the patients. How you doing today? I'm Kevin, I'm with Mesa Fire. What's your name? Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Looks like you hurt yourself today. You got a little cut on your head. What happened? Do you remember? No. You don't remember? <laughs> You've been drinking a little bit today, Charlie? No. Audible Ale. That's a good brew. A How much of these have you had? Um, one, two, one three, or two. Four. Okay. Do you know where you're at right now, Charlie? No? Okay. Do you know what day of the week it is, Charlie? No. Okay. Charlie, this gentleman behind you is hanging onto your head. We'd like to take a look at you. Make sure you're okay. All right? I'm okay. No, Charlie, just I want you to relax. Okay? You've obviously fallen. You've hurt yourself pretty good. Okay? We want to just make sure that you're okay. All I'm, right? I'm okay. Charlie, just try and sit still for me. All right? I want to be sure that you're okay. All right? This gentleman to your right here, this is Ed. Ed's going to take care of you. He's going to, put, he's going to do a little assessment on you. We're going to check no. your vital signs. Charlie, so is it okay Charlie. if we check your vital signs? How about we just check your vital signs and go from there, okay? I'm okay. All right, Charlie, just relax for me, all right? Let us do our job. Ed, go ahead and do an assessment right. for me. How you doing, Charlie? Okay. Been drinking today? Just a little bit? Charlie, what kind of medical history do you have? Do you have any kind of cardiac history? Anything no. about your case. Charlie, are you feeling dizzy at all right now? No. No? Okay. Do you have diabetes or do you have seizure history, anything like that? Relax, Charlie. No. No? Charlie, do you take medications for any reason? Charlie, do you live around here? You do? 
Do you have anybody we can call? Here's who we hey, got. Back here, Char 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 Charlie wow. doesn't seem to remember hey, what's going on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Obviously, yeah, he's got this about two inch laceration to his forehead. He's, he's uh, not alert, okay? I asked him where he's at. He doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't know what day of the week this is. Um, he's a little bit, uh, he's a little incoherent and he's not very cooperative. So I'd like to go ahead and do a uh, full assessment on him and see where we're at with it. Both hands, okay? Don't let me push your fingers together. Kind of hold them stiff. You can do that? Okay. How about over here? Hold them stiff, Charlie. There you go. I'm all right. Hey, Charlie. Okay, Ed, what do you got so far on, on Charlie here? Well, we have nothing on the head and neck. His back seems to be clear. He's not screaming that there's any pain that I've touched so far. Okay. I still need to check out his I feet. saw you got, the, uh, you got his hands assessed. We, we do his lower body yet. Let's go ahead and finish with okay. the lower body. Casey, go ahead and hang on to there. <clears throat> hey, Charlie. I want you to pull your toe. Charlie, you remember where you're at yet? No. No? You know what day of the week it is yet, Charlie? Yeah, Friday, I think. I think it's Friday, good. You're coming around a little bit for me. Charlie, how many beers have you had today? Oh, two or three. Just two or three? Um, maybe more. I don't maybe know. a little bit more, okay. Judging well, from the bottles I see around here, it looks like you've had about a six pack. Is mm -hmm. that possible? Yeah. Okay. You want a C-spinal? Yeah, and let's go ahead and see spine. I, you know, I, I got that he's, uh, he's got no neurological deficit. He's not getting any pain um, on palpation, but I'm a little concerned about his uh, level of consciousness with having been under the influence of alcohol. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and see spine him and uh, let, the, let the hospital take care of that. All right. Go ahead and see spine All right, spine go ahead and get a collar on him. We'll go ahead and uh, get a backboard in here. One, two, three. Good. Okay. All right, how's that feel, Charlie? Are you good? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna put some straps. We're gonna put some straps across you, Charlie. I want to put your hand. I want you to put your hands up. I want to reassess you. All right, just like he was doing to you earlier. All right, neck, anything? You still feel me touching you? We're good. All right, relax your hands. Okay, Charlie, they're gonna strap you down here. All right. What's going on, Charlie? Charlie. Charlie. Hey. Charlie. Hey. Charlie, just try and relax. All right. Oh. Charlie. What's going on, Charlie? Charlie, what's going on? I don't want to be strapped. I'm, all right, guys. I'm all right, just relax, Charlie. Just settle down for just a second. All right, guys. Let's let's change up our plan here. All right, Charlie's not comfortable being strapped down here, so um, we're good with his C-spine. We've already reassessed it. All right, Charlie. I just want you to relax now. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take you off of this backboard, guys. I'm just seeing a lot, way too much body movement on him. I don't feel comfortable with that. Rather than fight him in this backboard. Let's go ahead and take him off the backboard. Let's go ahead and take these straps off him real quick. Relax, Charlie. Okay? Relax. Just, Charlie, just hang on for a second. We're going to get you off this backboard. Hey, Ben, just so you know what's going on. He's just moving way too much right now. I'd like to get him off of this backboard. Okay. He, he was fine C-spine. We assessed that. My only concern is that he's, he's under the influence of alcohol, and I just want to keep him in a C-collar and assess him when he gets to the hospital. But this is just causing him way too much. So let's go ahead and just, we're thinking we're just going to transport him on the, on the uh, gurney without the backboard. Okay. okay, you good with that? Good. All right, cool. All right, Charlie, here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep you on this board until I get you on the gurney. Then we're going to slide the board out from under you. Just relax. Don't be moving your head on me. All right? We're going to lift you up onto this with this backboard and put you on the gurney. And we're going to slide it out. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll do anything. Just get me off this board. Okay, then just relax for me, all right, while we do that. Slide it out. Slide it down this way. Is that good? You hang on to a cervical collar. All right. All right. We're going to slide the board out. That block and I catch him on the way out? No, we'll just lift him up like a log. Let's just go and log lift him. All right, so I'm gonna get him at the waist. So I'm gonna get the board. You got the board, Ben? Got the board. All right. You ready, Case, on your call? Ready. On three? One, two, three. Up and down. All right, Charlie, you good with that? Yeah. More comfortable? Yeah. All right, we are gonna put seatbelts on you. Hopefully that's okay, all right? You let us know if you're hurting anywhere. All right, Charlie, before we move you one more time, I just want to assess you again and make sure you're okay. I want you to put your fingers. Were you the driver of this car? This one, yeah. Are you, in it? Are you hurt? Um, I mean, my back hurts, my shoulders and my neck. Let's go walk you over here. We're going to we'll evaluate you. 
What's your name? Amy. Amy, my name's Scott, all right? I'm going to check you out, all right? Okay. Did you have your seatbelt on? Yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do is run my fingers down your spine, all right? Okay. And I want you to tell me where I'm pushing, if it hurts or not. Okay. All right? Anywhere on your neck where I'm pushing? Not where you're pushing, no. but maybe the side. To the side? Okay, yeah. how about down here? Not where you're pushing, okay. but my... Here? Nothing? No. Nowhere where I'm pushing? Not where you're pushing. Okay. What I want you to do is hold your arm straight out. Okay, put your wrist back. Put your fingers out. Don't let me move your wrists. Okay, don't let me squeeze your fingers. Any numbness or tingling to here? No. Okay, can you feel my hands? Yeah. Okay, put your legs out. Push down on my hands like a gas pedal. Okay, curl your toes up towards your head. All right, can you feel this? Yeah. Okay, no numbness or tingling? No. No? Okay. What do we have? A uh, restrained driver, uh, low speed. She was uh, ambulating at the scene. Uh, no neck or back pain. Uh, Neuro's intact times four, no point tenderness down her spine. Do we need a ceasefire? No, I think she should go as is. Up and up. Okay, we're going to get you up here and get you over to the gurney, okay? Okay. Okay, okay I'm going to assess you one more time again, okay? okay? Okay. Put your arms out, fingers apart. Okay. Can you feel that? Yeah. All right. All right. Push down on my hands. Bring it up toward your head. Any tingling or numbness? No. no? Any tingling or numbness to your upper extremities? No. All right. Uh, Mike, what do we have down there? Looks like a gunshot wound to the head. Oh we can go God. ahead and clear the rest of them. All right. Okay. Sitting on the back. Oh on the back. Sir, can you hear me? I think secondary, we got a good strong radio pulse. Let's go ahead and roll him over. Get the backboard ready. We'll roll him over and clear his front. Are we going to consider C spine? Put the C collar on him. Uh, we do not need a C collar for this patient. This is an isolated head wound. No other uh, injuries that we see. seen. It appears no uh, chest, back, or uh, other other deficits that we're finding here. Let's work him as a trauma gentleman. Let's get him moving. Sir, what is your name? Okay, we got a gun. Okay, it's clear. Gun. What do we have there? Uh, got a gun. Okay, secure that weapon. Engine 286 to alarm. Can you respond, PD, for a possible gunshot victim? Uh, negative. Oh, nice. Hypo 2 Negative. Hypo 2 zone. Get a baseline set of vitals. Oh. As far as we can see right now, it is isolated. What is your name? <laughs> Sir, can you answer me? What is your name? All right, let's get him on the gurney and get him out of here. Hey, we got a good set. Okay. We'll uh, remove the backboard once he's on the gurney. Have you remove the board once we get him lifted up here? All right, on your count. One, two, three. Give me the back of the ride. Start IVs and route. Watch his arm. You guys got that? Again, I want to thank the Arizona EMS Group, Dr. Frank Castromarion, the Chandler Fire Department, the Mesa Fire Department, and the Scottsdale Fire Department. At this time, this concludes the training piece for the selective spinal mobilization for the Northwest Ohio EMS Consortium. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask your chiefs or any of us medical directors.